week five of the peak summer season. We're at Rockland Park, which is near Paul in Dorset. Um, two shows today. Uh, the first show here, Rockland Park, kicks off at 12. We're going to call in the wrestling ring up shortly. Do that one now and then do that one, please. Come on, come on. Thank you. As the show kicks off as well, finishes at one, the rest of the movie goes straight down back into the van. We drive an hour down the road into Weymouth, where we've got our second show of the day at Lipsy Holiday Park, and that kicks off at half past three. So it's a bit of a mad rush, I'm sure you'll see, as we get the ring up, ring down, ring up, ring down. Hell of a day, Sunday. Sunday's a fun day, I like it. What a beautiful man! The main aim of the day is we get there on time, the ring's safe, it's presentable and we put on the best matches we can for both the shows. You want chocolates there, Mark? Do you want me to bring it over for you? Yeah, please. First match done, Rockley Park. It's never easy, a 12 o'clock show, you're never quite sure how the audience is going to be whether they're tired from the night before. We went out there, we'd done it, we'd done our best with it, we got reaction to an extent, maybe. Could have been a little bit better, it could have been a hell of a lot worse. Keep those energy levels up, two shows a day. Before the pandemonium of ripping the ring down begins, the fans get a chance to meet and greet their favorite wrestlers. As for now, what we need to do is Get our asses in gear and get down there ASAP. One of the most frequently asked questions I get is how long does it take to pull up and take down a wrestling ring? then you would not believe it. If you hang about till the end, you might find out. When you've got two shows in one day, especially when one's at 12 o'clock and the other one's at half past three, it's just a complete nightmare. All it's going to take is for this road to clog up and we can be absolutely screwed. Don't panic, the traffic cleared. We've made it every single day of the season so far with flying colours. So we've got like 20 minutes to get the ring up and they've still got the front of the stage out and they're rehearsing. We got the ring up and the show begins. <laughs> it's amazing how easily it's done when you've got a great team of guys working together. As the day's gone on, we've gone from strength to strength. But the question is, Exactly how long did it take us to get the ring up? Yeah, 10 minutes. 15? Yeah, we'll go with 15. 25 minutes. I'll go with 10 minutes and 10 minutes. So it could probably be about 35, 45 minutes. Half an hour. But Phil Powers is, is the second best ring man. Yeah, yeah, he's good, but he chats a lot. After a hard working day, it's time to unwind with some team bonding. Where are we off to tonight? We are going to see Jimmy Carr. The one and only Jimmy Carr. Does At the world famous wrestling venue, the Weymouth Pavilion. You've been really nervous about making it here on time as well, haven't you? You've been like itching. Come I get hurry itchy. Up. I get hurry itchy. up, hurry up, get to the Weymouth Pavilion. I want to see my Jimmy Carr. My Jimmy Carr. When there's a certain specific deadline, you always worry about all the things in the world going wrong, right? You're always thinking, oh, well, you know, it's only down the road, but if we leave here, we find that something always goes The question wrong. is, you have told me that you know Jimmy Carr on first name terms, and you're a very good friend of his. You've got complimentary tickets to this gathering this evening, which I'm very, very grateful for. Are we, me, you, and the people watching this, the seven viewers watching this, hmm. are we going to film Jimmy Carr saying hello to Josh Faulkner? That's the thing, uh, it waits to be seen. Uh, I do know Jimmy quite well. I'm working with him for quite a few years on quite a few of his television projects. Most recently, Your Face or Mine, Comedy Central. 
never said an honest word in your life, Jeff Faulkner. Here we go, we're hitting the seafront now, we're going to be... And it, it, it's literally three minutes past seven, I don't know what you was panicking about. Ah, uh, three minutes yeah. past seven, it could be, be 7.33 by the time we get to the pavilion. Because we're going to be sat in the auditorium doing nothing now with a bunch of Jimmy Carr fans. I, I think I'd much rather spend my time with uh, Jimmy Carr fans than the wrestling fans of Weymouth. Uh, uh, uh. Hey, hey, we love our fans. Josh Faulkner, Phil Powers, if anything exciting happens, we're going to carry on going. But as for now, I'm in the wrong lane. Now that it's all said and done and the working day is over, is Josh Faulkner going to give to us that clip of a lifetime that's going to send our YouTube views into a frenzy? Let's see. It's been enjoyable today. It's been enjoyable. You never said an honest word in your life, Josh Faulkner. How dare you? Steve Hennam, I play Dance and Thunderbolt, uh, who is the father of Luke, and I'm the real life father of Luke uh, in real life as well. And I'm the creator of the blogs Living with Luke. Oh, one, two, three, four! I play Luke, who is Steve's son, um, autistic son. Uh, that's my part. I've done it for three years now, I don't want to stop. It's about my ever crumbling relationship with my teenage autistic son Luke uh, who has been growing away from me emotionally and physically since he was about 12 or 13 years old. And it's set in the wrestling ring because it's about the way that I have to wrestle with the autistic shadow that's cast a shadow over our lives every day. It's Matt's first time performing on the show. Nail it, nail it, nail it down, I think, with the help of my fellow actors who will lead me through this, I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll be alright. She'll be Jew if she's able, you know the Queen of Hearts is always your best bear. I trained 
drama school, so I've done quite a lot of professional stuff. I've done play something with stage right, uh, Bohemian and Culture's Demand, uh, a few things, one thing on the BBC, so I've done quite a few other bits and pieces. One of the things that struck me in rehearsal was our lead actor had shaved his head very similar to mine. I shaved it today. Oh. But so tomorrow you have I to shave it again? No. Oh. No. But it only takes about five or six days for it to start growing through. Balls in my court. Yes. So be just right. be on the ball, all of us, just in case the mat just has a little bit of a slip. And we'll be ready. Good luck. Thank you, Mike. This is Phil Powers and backstage at the Art Centre in Colchester, five minutes away from showtime with the performance of Living With Luke. I can't wait, this is going to be a relaxed performance, it's going to be exciting. Um, it's kind of going to be a little test to see how the chemistry of the show works with the new crew, but I'm really excited and looking forward to it. This is going to happen, it's going to be fine. We're going to succeed, we're going to, we're going to achieve here. You're the man, you are the man. Who's the man? You're the man. You're the man. You're the man. Everyone knows the nerves you get just before you go out on stage. Anything can happen in a live performance when you're out there for an hour. I'm not going to give too much away because if you want to see this performance, you've got to pay for a ticket. However, there is one thing I'm going to say. When the lights went down and the show finished, this is what happened. The UWA was a wrestling promotion set up in 1998 and founded by Dan Belinka and Andrew Martin. Dan Belinka had previous experience working for the World Wrestling Federation. Andrew Martin, not to be confused with Dale Martin Promotions, had very good experience in finance and sponsorship. The wrestling promotion had its first show at the Epping Country Club and the show headline match was Phil Powers versus the Dirt Bike Kid. The show also included Paul Sloan versus Bully Boy Briggs, Tiger McGuigan versus Jason Cross, Johnny Kid versus Steve Gray, Big Papa T versus Wearer. Steve Linsky cut a promo to introduce Doug Williams to the crowd who had a match with Phil Powers. The Epping Country Club was a sellout, which in 1998 was a very good achievement. This show got a lot of hype and was reviewed in a lot of the wrestling media and magazines such as Power Slam at the time. The UWA got offered a television contract with Live TV, which was a popular London-based television cable station. All-Star Wrestling had been approached by Live TV previously, however All-Star Wrestling declined a deal with Live TV. The first set of television tapings were at Crystal Palace in 1999. This show got a lot of television hype and was even advertised on TNT Nitro during the adverts for their television wrestling programming. Crystal Palace National Indoor Arena in 1999 was going to be an unbelievable challenge for the Ultimate Wrestling Alliance, especially considering the actual British wrestling show at the time was lucky to draw over 160 people and business had been very much down for the previous three years. Selling the Epping Country Club out was a great achievement, however this was a whole different level. The cast of the show from the Epping Country Club was going to be completely different and the UWA searched to find the best British wrestling talent at the time they could in 1999. The best British talent at the time was Stevie Knight, 
Danny Royal, Kerry Cabrero, Doug Williams, Jason Cross, Phil Powers, Alex Shane, The Death Squad, Paul Tyrrell, Steve Morocco. Many more great British talented names to that list. The UWA managed to convince Mick McManus to become the chairman of the UWA and he was presented as an authority figure on TV which gained a huge buzz. The show in Crystal Palace managed to draw around about 1,200 people which was disappointing because 2,000 is what was expected. I'll never forget that night, the audience being really late coming in. And I mean, it was literally 10 minutes before bell time and there was only 100 people in there. And two minutes before the show started, bang, along come like another 800, then it mounted up to 1,200. I put that down to the fact there's so much to do at Crystal Palace National Indoor Arena that um, when you walk in, you just want to go for a wander about and look at everything before you go to the main arena. The show itself, uh, what it was, was good. The talent pool at the time perhaps was a little bit overwhelmed with the situation, which looking back at it, I think a lot of people today would be too. Standout moments on that show were Jason Cross versus Tiger Mask. Big Papa T's ring entrances proved to be memorable. Hot Stuff Stevie Knight's match with Jody Flash that was sanctioned by Mick McManus was a very memorable match. The show main event featured a 10-man gauntlet match. Danny Royal, Kerry Cabrero, Mad Dog McPhee, Phil Powers, The Fallen Angel, Christopher Daniels, Stevie Knight, Doug Williams, battling it out to see who would become the first UWA television champion. The gauntlet match was very much a 1990s British wrestling idea that had been used around the circuit. It was similar to a Raw Rumble, however it was pinfall. So once a man had been pinned, the next man would come out and obviously at the end, the last man is the winner. This match obviously gives huge advantage to number nine. This was an entertaining match that got well received that was won by Phil Powers. Was this event a raging success or a failure? It was a great attempt to revive British wrestling. Perhaps a little bit too much too soon and could have done with a little bit more build up to have built an audience of 2000 people. However, 1200 was not bad. That was a fantastic achievement for the time. UWA Wrestling Rampage was soon to debut on live TV with half an hour episodes going out three times a week. The viewing figures were very impressive. At the time, wrestlers such as Jason Cross, Danny Rawl, Kerry Cabrero, Doug Williams and Phil Powers were to become names within the wrestling industry because of this television deal. They also deemed to be very popular within areas that had live TV and cable networks. The next few set of UWA television tapings were scheduled for the Blackpool Pleasure Beach at the Blackpool Ice Arena. This was a very interesting and controversial move as the majority of the UWA talent was Southern based and the company was Southern based itself. So going to Blackpool Pleasure Beach was out of its comfort zone. TV tapings would consist of a matinee performance and an evening performance. The audiences did take a hit in the afternoon and the television tapings may have looked a little bit embarrassing on live television. However, the attendances were better for the evening shows, but nowhere near as good as hoped for or expected. Taking the show to Blackpool Pleasure Beach was probably the biggest mistake any promoter could make. The track record of wrestling on the Pleasure Beach had been very poor throughout the last five years and in many ways wrestling had just been overexposed in Blackpool. Considering the majority of attendances for events at Blackpool for other promoters were round about the 70 to 120 fans mark, the UWA actually done a good job in drawing 450 
for the evening shows at Blackpool on average. It was nowhere near the thousand fans per event that it needed on paper to make it profitable and look good in the boardroom for the shareholders. It was very obvious to a lot of people at the time that this had become a complete financial disaster. However, creative wise and looking at the show, the show was starting to look promising and good and had built up a following. If the UWA was to be performing its shows in better venues, it would be selling out, which was proven when the UWA hosted an event at the Broadway Theatre Barking to a sellout audience. The total capacity for this venue was round about 500 people, which was absolutely perfect for an event that the UWA were producing. Many people would say the Broadway Theatre Barking Show was the best and most perfect event that the UWA put on. I myself would say I don't believe that the UWA ever got past the magic of the Epping Country Club. If they would have stuck with the Epping Country Club and in and around that London area, I believe that the company would still be running today in 2022. Shortly after the event at the Broadway Theatre Barking, Live TV seized trading. The Mirror Group decided to get rid of their acquisition due to the Greyhound Racing contract expiring, which made the TV channel unsustainable. UWA programming was on live television up until the end of the station's tender. During this time, the UWA never ceased trading, but there was a period of around about five to six months and it didn't run any shows. The UWA then partnered up with Sports Mondial, which was a large sports group based in St. James Square in London. Sadly, a dispute between owners of both companies meant that the UWA was no longer welcome to be a part of Sports Mondial. However, UWA employee at the time, Ross Hutchinson, stayed with Sports Mondial and decided to create a wrestling promotion called UCW. The promotion only run two shows, one at Goldsbrook Leisure Centre in Dagenham and another one at the Coventry Sky Dome before they quickly ceased trading. Very shortly after they seized trading, there was a huge boom in professional wrestling with promoters such as the Wrestling Alliance, All-Star Wrestling and Reslo drawing huge audiences in. So into the new decade, the noughties, wrestling, British wrestling was back and it was bigger and stronger than ever. Some would argue that the popularity of wrestling on live TV contributed towards this boom. Many would argue it was the popularity of WWE and the Attitude Era. However, it was a very good time moving forward to be a professional wrestler. Sadly, not many of the UWA wrestlers were mainstays in the wrestling business, which I found very disappointing. The guy to go on to do the most was probably Doug Williams and myself, Phil Powers. However, guys like Danny Rawl, Kerry Cabrero and Stevie Knight would soon quit the business. I hope this gives you some insight in the late 90s and the UWA. Thank you very much for clicking on this thumbnail. Please check out more thumbnails from Ring Slam Wrestling and watch loads of our videos. Thank you very much for clicking on. Thank you for clicking on this video, Wrestling Ring Builder. You've either clicked on this through our YouTube channel, Ring Slam Wrestling, or you have clicked on this video through this website, which is www.wrestlingringbuilder.com. I'm Phil Powers, and the purpose of this video is to let you know I will once again, after a five-year absence, be producing wrestling rings for the public. Well, when I say the public, people that have an involvement in professional wrestling. Thank you very much for showing an interest. As you can see on the screen, there has been a video of the setup of the wrestling rings. The standard size is 16 foot square, however we do 14 foot rings and we also will do an 18 foot ring or a 20 foot ring depending on your requirements. Our latest design has been tried and tested over the last seven years and 
the current one that I'm using that I've also sold to five other clients is working incredibly well and is showing no signs of aging. One of the biggest problems that rings have is the ring does eventually bow over time. However, we have reversible bars on this particular ring, as you could tell by the video earlier on, and that means that you can reverse the bars over from show to show so it doesn't show any signs of warping or banana bar that i like to call it which is a um a problem with wrestling rings an awful lot the ropes go incredibly tight on this particular design of rings so you have no worries about having slack ropes we have a superb matting that goes on the ring too the rings bounce well but obviously they don't bounce too much because too much bounce is a bad thing on a professional wrestling ring you're in safe hands with these rings if you do decide to go ahead and purchase one they are proved tried and tested and the these rings have worked in practically every theatre up and down the country. I've produced wrestling rings for plenty of wrestling promoters, probably built up to 250 rings in my time. So you have no problems when you're coming to me as your ring builder. We pride ourselves on longevity with the ring. You can find videos all over YouTube of these um, rings working. All you have to do is... Um, Send me an email. My email address is on the bottom of the screen. Send us an email and we can arrange a telephone conversation. But you can see these rings all over YouTube currently working. Now let's go get down to the dirty cost. Um, unfortunately, the prices do fluctuate from month to month due to the cost of steel going up and down. Sometimes you might get lucky, sometimes you might get unlucky, but at the minute it's um, fair to say we're averaging a price of £4,000. Um, it could be a little bit lower than that. It could be a little bit higher than that. You just need to shoot me up at the time. Um, we will only be limiting ourselves to making free wrestling rings a month. So if we're fully booked, you may have to wait a couple of months for your order to process. However, when you do make your order with me, I can guarantee you that your ring will be ready within three to five weeks. As far as delivery go, we will ask that you come to our site and you collect the wrestling ring in person. We can negotiate this um, when we do the deal for the ring, how this is going to work. If you do require a delivery, there will be an extra delivery fee. However, we do not deliver into Europe because we have had problems with that before in the past. Any Europeans are welcome to come to our site and collect on the spot. We would appreciate it if you did come to our site because we would like for you to learn how to set the ring up properly. We will offer a full training day of dismantling and erecting the ring and also loading it in a transit van because where the main bar is 10 foot long, this ring comfortably goes into a standard long wheelbase panel van, which will work very, very well in the future, especially when all vans move across to electric in the next five, 10 years time. That's if that happens. As another product, we also offer a flooring, which is an incredibly good training product for your gymnasium. Can be good for kickboxing, catchers catch can wrestling and boxing as well. So if you have a fitness studio, a flooring will be absolutely ideal for you. These range at a price of um, from 1,500 to 2,000 pounds, depending on the size of the ring that you would like for yourself. Well, thank you very much for watching this video. Once you place your order for the rings, which we will discuss in person over the phone because we do like to deal with things a very old fashioned way. What we will do is we will make YouTube videos of your ring being produced and we will make them unlisted so you will get regular updates of what's going on with your ring which will help our anxiety and will also help your anxiety because the last thing we want to do is make this experience an unpleasant one for yourselves so it is very important that we keep in touch with you the whole way through the ring building process. If you're feeling the itch and you want to get into the um, owning a wrestling ring business and perhaps even get yourself into the ring hire business, which can be incredibly lucrative, 
please give me a call and we'll discuss it and hopefully we can turn your dream into a reality. Thank you very much for watching this video and please don't be shy, I will look forward to hearing from you. Working with us this summer is one of the most legendary female wrestlers of all time, Helen Boots Klondike Kate. She is one of the most infamous, powerful and highest drawing female wrestlers. Even though she's now retired from the ring, it's good to have her watching over the show. But brace yourself, she's still as fiery as ever. Do not change that music. And she'll carry that to the grave. Meet Big Liam. The cannibal was a bit slack. His tag team partner's not impressed after he failed to capitalise on a move, meaning that the good guys take the win, which makes the office very happy. You know when you have a match, you're just sitting there reflecting on it all. You're not only reflecting on the match you just had, but you're thinking ahead to the one that's coming up. And you're constantly thinking, like, what did I do in that one that could be improved in the next one? So what was wrong with that match? Stop being in there being self-conscious, we wanted to be perfect. It's not going to be easy, it's going to be tough. No excuses. Life on the road can be a lot better when you share some common interests with the people you're travelling with and you all get along perfectly fine. Something bad has happened there. You can form brotherhoods and become training partners. In the wrestling world, one man's mistake can upset the whole team. We went to get a drink before it started. I am going to pay extra. No. I didn't realise I was late and I did rush back. To say cemented to this spot and not help with anything. Did you instruct him to just fucking Grab stand it. there? Where's the coffees? Defending him in front of everybody, saying he went to get the coffees. He tried to shake my hand, passing me in the hallway on the way to the mash bar. You know what he was doing? He was going to get himself a diet coke for himself. None of us wrestlers hold grudges forever. Things are about to become really chilled out. <laughs> And to be quite frank with you, they can all get f***ed. <laughs>